and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to welcome back to the show Chris Bailey. Chris has been on the show once before to talk about his book, The Productivity Project. Chris's story is essentially that he earned a business degree, and then instead of taking many of the lucrative job offers that he had, he decided to pursue a lifelong dream of spending a year performing a deep dive into experimenting in the subject of productivity. So he was basically the guinea pig for a bunch of productivity experiments on him. Himself. A lot of them are weird, a lot of them are fun, but they yielded great results. And that's what we talked about last time he was on the show, which I will link to in the show notes. But this time he's back to talk about his new book, Hyperfocus, How to Be More Productive in a World of Distraction. And I say this right up front in the conversation, but I'm going to repeat it here, that this book, honestly, I don't know that I need yet another book on focus, but I knew because it was from Chris, it wasn't going to be just that. And I was right. When I read the book, I found out that it's much more about the difference between hyperfocus and scatter focus, both of which are beneficial modes to be able to tap into and use. And in this conversation, if you're a person who strives to be able to focus, you're going to find a lot of helpful tips, but also you're going to find the ability to tap into or shift between hyperfocus and scatter focus, which also comes into benefit when it comes to coming up with ideas and generating lots of ideas to then switch over and use hyperfocus on. So with that said, enjoy this conversation with Chris Bailey. Well, this week I am thrilled to welcome back Chris Bailey to the show. It's been a while, but welcome back. Thanks, man. How have you been? I've it's been, been a great. while. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, but I've continued to read your newsletter. Oh, <laughs> so thank you. You're, <laughs> did, did you subscribe through that annoying pop up on my website? I or? have no idea. I doubt it because I hate <laughs> annoying pop ups, and most of the times those uh, push me away. Those are to, those are a distraction. Yeah, so. they. Are. I'm actually so torn. This is we're already on a tangent, right, but I'm so torn on that. I, I got rid of the pop up yesterday just as sort of an experiment because they provide you with so many new newsletter subscribers, but the people who are already on board and reading your stuff, it annoys the heck out of them. And so I thought maybe I should show a little bit of respect for the people who give me their time and their attention and, and read my stuff because there are a lot of blogs out there. There are a lot of people out there talking about productivity. So my, why not shut the thing off as, as an experiment? If it's back on the site, you'll know that it didn't work. <laughs> but, but right now it's working working all right. Yeah. See, and the thing is, is I'm not opposed to them per se because sometimes it can be hard to figure out where to go on somebody's site if you yeah. are truly interested and really do want to consider the idea of following them outside of social media in a in an email newsletter type fashion, which I think is where really the best people do some of their best work. You know, I, I follow yours, uh, Srinivas Rao from Unmistakable Creative. Oh, he's great. Uh, Cal Newport, I get his emails of his blog posts. I'm trying to think of what other newsletters I subscribe to, but it's very sparse. Uh, Chris Brogan, yeah. obviously, he's great. Um, obviously. So, and the thing is, is that the work there is a higher caliber, a higher quality. So, uh, I don't mind that. And so, if having to call attention to it quickly once, and then if I visit the site again later and I haven't signed up, it doesn't come back up. Cool. But like, yeah, if you bombard me every time I go, <laughs> you're you're. <laughs> Anyways, how's that yeah. for how's that for focus? How's that for focus? Yeah, on a podcast? we're very focused already. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we're in autopilot mode in in a way of conversation. Perhaps, perhaps. So, so you uh, you have a new book. You have a new book out. I'm hinting at it. It's called Hyper Focus: How to Be More Productive in a World of Distraction. And I'll be honest: if your name was not on this, I don't know that I really would have considered this book as a contender for somebody being a guest on this show. I'm one of those podcasts where I get so many pitches that I don't know how anybody in their right mind can dig through them. And there's a lot of deleting and there's, a, I know none of the people, here's the thing. I know none of the people that are pitching to me actually listens to the show. So they're not going to yeah. hear this, but all that to say, when I saw your name, I knew it was quality. So I wanted to dig deeper and I said, sure, send me the book. And then I started digging and I'm like, I know Chris has got a better take on this than it just being a duplication or a replicate, a replication of what everybody else is out there saying 
cut yeah. down on distractions and <laughs> you know cal newport deep Tame work. distractions ahead of time right and, yeah. and and it is so I, and and here's the thing you do state some of those common sense things but you yeah. do what you do well which is dig in deeper add some science add some strategy and uh take it to another level higher or lower i don't know what you want to call it like you dig deeper which elevates it. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Well, th- this book was kind of born out of what you just said. And, and I, this is kind of the, uh, the uncomfortable part about writing this book <laughs> that, that, I, that I went through is I found that, especially after writing The Productivity Project, uh, that you know, I filled my time with more distraction. I was one of these people who was, who was cranking out this advice. I wrote about it in the Productivity Project and on my website and, and in all these places where well, we should tame hey, distractions. We should focus. But. So, so let me distract you for one second and say, yes. let's spell out in like two or three sentences what the Productivity Project was, because I think that adds extra context to all of those distraction um, <laughs> techniques that you were trying yeah. out. Yeah, so Cole's notes summary or Cliff's notes. The one of them is Canadian and the other one's American. I've so always I Cliff, forget. Cliff is American because that's the one I'm okay. familiar with. I've never yeah, heard I'm of familiar. Cole's notes. Cole, so. Cole's notes is like the knockoff Canadian one, I'm pretty sure that 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 we uh, tore tore apart in high school. Uh but it, yeah, essentially the productivity project. I I graduated with a business degree, several job offers, um and you know, doing well up to that point, but I thought I'm going to decline all these jobs and get to the bottom of how we can become as productive as we possibly can. And so I spent a year of my life uh, digging through all the research I could find, interviewing all the greats, many of whom have been on your show. I, I poured through all the books, the journal articles, the and I ran a bunch of weird productivity experiments on myself, where essentially using myself as a productivity guinea pig, meditating for 35 hours over the course of one week, uh, living in total isolation for, for another week, all to come to some relatively simple conclusions in a really complicated way you know that productivity it's not just time management like you like is in in the name of the show it's more than just a to-do list it's also managing your attention and your energy and what lies at the core of that is intention and and choosing what you do before you do it um and and that kind of you know it went well the, the that book's out in i think 10 or 15 languages or something like that now and um and so i'm lucky that i get to continue experimenting with this weird passion for a living and you know, after writing that book, uh, you know, I found something uncomfortable and it was that I was giving all this advice that people should tame distractions. But then I found that I was pretty distracted myself as, and especially as somebody who calls himself uh, a quote unquote productivity expert. It was kind of this, this finding that uh, created the, this uh, dissonance within myself where I thought, Man, if if I'm this distracted and I'm giving this advice, maybe the advice doesn't work. Maybe there's a better solution out there. Maybe there's a reason why uh, we're wired for for distraction and not wired to to focus on stuff. And so that's really what what led to this book. And I, I think, like you said, what makes the book different. Um, it, you know, I I think this is one of those books where the obvious advice is not the best advice. Um, you know, the, the advice that always makes sense to say, uh, sometimes when you try it out, it doesn't necessarily work. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that was a big, big finding with, with this project, at least. Okay, so give me one of those examples, because uh, I want to kind of set the uh, stage here for, again, this yeah. being not just another book about focus, but some of the <laughs> stranger tactics that are contained. Yeah. There. Well, what one of them, what one kind of curious finding is, you know, focusing is great and, and you know, it helps us become more productive, but so is unfocusing. And, and I think one of the things that differentiates this book is just the, 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 the piles of science behind it and uh, underneath it or above it or below it. I don't know what direction you want to go in, but it was kind of the power of unfocusing. And uh, one, one of the experiments I conducted in this book was making myself bored 
for an hour a day for an entire month. Because I realized like, okay, I'm focusing a lot using the tactics that I was writing about, but I was also pretty burnt out at that point. So I thought, what about the flip side of focus? What about boredom? What about just letting your mind be for a little bit? And so for for one month, for an hour a day, I did things like uh, I, I read the iTunes terms and conditions for, <laughs> for a day. I got through it two and a half times. It's actually pretty short uh, and readable, more readable than I found. I watched one cloud in the sky. I uh, peeled exactly five potatoes in another hour. Uh, in another hour, I waited on hold with Air Canada's baggage claims department. <laughs> and it was funny because um, I got the same lady each time after waiting on hold for for about 20, 25 minutes. So I'm pretty sure there's just one lady manning Air Canada's baggage claims uh, department phone number, but that's that's beside the point. And, and I found that some curious things. Um, and, and, you know, boredom is something that we resist. And I think rightfully so, because it's not fun to be bored, but it does get us into this mode where our mind is able to wander a little bit. And I found myself, you know, it's kind of the same effect as taking a shower, where when we're in the shower, we're everywhere but the shower. We're planning our day. We're connecting ideas. We're remembering the past. We're, we're uh, remembering our dreams. We're planning. We're thinking about our relationships. And the same is true any moment of the day, you don't have to read the, the iTunes terms and conditions, but the same is true whenever you're uh, just kind of relaxing. One, one of my favorite new hobbies after writing this book is knitting. You know, it's because it's a great way to let your mo- attention rest. And when your attention is resting, uh, the research shows uh, that there was a great study done by Jonathan Schooler and Jonathan Smallwood, uh, where they found that our mind has this built-in prospective bias. And when our attention is at rest, we think about the future and we plan for the future uh, 48% of the time. And so we aren't just kind of knitting. We aren't just taking a shower. We aren't just woodworking or working out. We're setting intentions. We're planning our day. And this helps us when we need to focus later on. So in addition to planning, we're resting, we're connecting ideas. And uh, this is kind of the beautiful part about having this bigger picture of our attention and actually experimenting with the stuff uh, was that, you know, tame and distractions helps us focus, but so does not focusing in the first place. And so there, there are kind of uh, some, some weird ideas like that that, um, uh, that I stumbled upon. So this is uh, essentially the, the kind of, um, let's see, the, the difference or the, uh, the contrast, but also the connection or uh, symbiosis between, again, hyper-focus and then what you call scatter focus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, the, these two modes of our brain, one is, uh, you know, the, the research calls them task positive and task negative, uh, where hyper focus, we're, we're just focusing on something. And scatter focus, our attention is scattered, our mind is wandering. Uh, but we do so deliberately. You know, when our mind wanders against our will, when we're trying to focus, that's not necessarily all that productive. But when our intention is to do that, um, it can be remarkably powerful. And these are the two mental uh, modes of our attention. And so when we're focused, we can't be unfocused. And the same is true vice versa. And in fact, the the brain regions that correspond and support each of these modes are anti-correlated with one another. And so that when the the default mode network, which supports scatter focus, is activated, uh, the, the focus network in our brain is not activated and vice versa. And so we really do, our attention is like a seesaw in this way where, um, you know, we, we hyper-focus on something, hopefully, without distraction. Uh, but then the seesaw kind of starts to go in the other direction and we need to recharge and rest and plan and set intentions. And then we find that we're recharged and then the seesaw swings the other way. And so I think by managing that that seesaw uh, of attention, this is a, this is, um, uh, you know, a, a way of framing it that I that I hadn't thought about before. But it, it, you know, by managing that seesaw, we can manage our attention and and then manage our life. Well, see, and that would be a hard title for a book to be like how to hyper focus and then uh, not focus and the, the yeah. benefits of both sides of the coin and da 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 da. da. You know, like <laughs> yeah. that just doesn't sell. It's it's we can't so much have like a yeah. Right. You gotta have something that sells, right? That gets people in the door. Right. I think that's why the cover is so bright and red. 
<laughs> but but in both of those modes, hyper focus and uh, scatter focus, your the the key word there is intention. And I think yes. the other key piece is then you open up the book talking all about the lack of intention on either side and kind of going down the middle in the mode that most of us spend most of our time in, which is this autopilot mode. Yeah, and I think and it's difficult to measure your productivity when you do knowledge work for a living, right? Because, you know, one person can write 500 lines of code and another person could write a thousand lines of code. And the person that wrote 500 in, say, two hours and the other person wrote a thousand in in five hours, the person that wrote 500 in two hours, the code might be better. It might have five features as opposed to three. It might have fewer bugs and it might do the, you know, more uh, in essentially uh, less, fewer lines. So how do you measure knowledge work? Uh, But I think the benchmark that is worth considering above everything else is this idea of intentionality. And I I think our productivity uh, is directly proportional to the percentage of the day that we act with intention behind what we're doing. And this is impossible to do 100% of the time. You know, only a monk in a cave who meditates for uh, six hours every day and and drinks tea the rest of the day uh, can can achieve this level of intention. But I, I think the level of intention that we have when it comes to the work that we do is so low. Uh, you know, it's probably uh, five or ten percent. Most of the time, like you said, this autopilot mode. It, it's when our email inbox becomes our to-do list. It's when we use our phone for thirty minutes in bed before getting up. It's when uh, we bounce from meeting to meeting to meeting, just going through the motions of our day, and then we lie down at the end of the day with our phone in our bed, and we ask ourselves, "Man, like, where did that day go?" But but then you have the opposite side where the proportion of your day that you act with intention goes up and things become more deliberate and beautiful. You have this deliberate focus. And, you know, most of us experience uh, this deliberate focus, this hyper focus, uh, just when we're on a deadline. And maybe we don't have the the luxury of tending to distractions and we're not tempted by Facebook and Twitter. But um, I, I really think that the difference between these two types of days is how we manage our attention. And, you know, it's, the book is called Hyperfocus, and it's, but it's essentially a book about how we can deliberately manage our attention throughout the day. You know, this, this uh, beautiful, this limited, this constrained ingredient that, that I think has never been uh, more essential than it is today. And, th- you know, again, the impetus for the book was that I, I had never found myself so busy, but while accomplishing uh, so little. And I think the reason for that was because I had so so little control over my attention before I uh, set out to look at the research on the topic. See, and I would argue that, and I think you would maybe agree with me, that autopilot mode has some benefits because it may not take as much energy to use it. In other words, it's autopilot, and, and, and it means uh, you're not intentionally thinking about it. And yeah. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. Another is, hey, if you can program your autopilot to a certain extent by having intention up front and then habitualizing the right yeah. things that are then sitting inside of your autopilot mode, then you're good to go. Like if you've autopiloted. Oh, yeah. You know, if you've well, in, that's all a habit is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you I mean, again, if we if, if we if we do this, if we step back for a second and say, OK, how do I want to be intentionally uh, ahead of myself so that I don't have to think about things like I take certain decisions out of play that I don't have to make and they're already made for me. Uh, you know, maybe you do some of the prep where, you know, you're certain, you know, you have certain clothing options that are already set. You have certain things in the morning where you've already set up yeah. your, your workout routine, different, th- you know, you've set up, it, you've worn a groove to where you can get into the groove and go through your morning without having to be intentional about it. You've put, you can put it on autopilot. That's the healthy side of things. But yeah. a lot of what you're talking about, <laughs> you know, is a lot of us <laughs> unintentionally just fall into a rut and yeah. put autopilot on without thinking about it and just go about our business. And then, you know, we, we go from browser to browser tab uh, over and over again, checking mm-hmm. things and, all of those other distraction uh, items. 
Well, the, yeah, that's kind of the art of focus is to to choose what to be deliberate about. Um, and, and, you know, it's probably good that, like, like you said, we don't work on, uh, you know, we have autopilot mode at our disposal. Habits are, are an amazing example of this. You know, once something becomes a habit, all we have to do is initiate the habit sequence and, and then our brain uh, kind of runs through the rest of the habit su- sequence by itself w- without much intervention. Uh, but but uh, yeah, it's good that we're not deliberate about everything. Like, you know, if we need ketchup, for example, maybe we don't want to, you know, uh, sit down with our iPad Pro and make a mind map of all the different kinds of ketchup and then really kind of zero in and ask for feedback from from 10 or 15 different people and really be deliberate about buying the the container of ketchup at the end of the day. You know, the, our, our time is limited. And so it's good that we have this mode. And it's good that we have this mode often when we're responding to email, especially when it's when, when it's a simple message. You know, are you free for dinner? Um, you don't want to fire up a Word document and then, you know, begin to type up a response and then ask a, a few people for feedback, um, all to arrive at just saying, yeah, sure, I'm good for dinner. <laughs> you know, so it's good that we can deploy this intelligently. But uh, I I think where this intention becomes uh, the most important is where we choose what to focus on. And, uh, you know, this is this is such a simple idea, uh, but some of the best ideas are where we need to choose what we focus on before we focus on something. Th- this is, I would argue, uh, the most important decision that we make throughout the day. And so we choose to focus on email and then we run through a few habit sequences in our mind and responding to a few and archiving a few, but then we have deliberate thought within that with it within that the 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 boundaries of that intention as well. But I think where the intention starts, um, we need that deliberateness uh, behind what we're doing. It's it's like the wood behind an arrow, that deliberateness behind our actions. Yeah. Well and you even talk a little bit about setting stronger intentions, which uh, right off the bat, that doesn't seem like, well, okay, I'll, I'll be more intentional. Like I'll just want it more. No, what it is, is it means it's instead of being vague about something, you drill down into it and be specific about it. Yeah, precisely. And, and this, this, uh, stems from, um, from research that, uh, Peter Golitzer has done where he looks at the, uh, the efficacy of an intention that's kind of general, like, uh, work out this weekend versus setting an intention that is, uh, what, it, what is called an implementation intention. And so essentially, before you begin to do something, you think through the process by which you will need to accomplish that thing. And so instead of go to the gym this weekend, it's, uh, you know, at 8 a.m., uh, f- you know, text Mike and go to the gym together, Wh- whatever it might be. Um, you know, we, we kind of make our intentions more specific in that way. And this, you know, it, this might not be worth doing if, if the, uh, efficacy of our intentions went up five or 10% because it's a bit of extra work, but in practice, especially with the ones that we care about and especially with the ones that we find difficult to do. If something is simple and we care about it, then we don't need to make it that specific. But when it's more difficult and, uh, and you know, we, we care about it, um, we need to, we need to make it as specific as possible and think through how we'll actually do it. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think that yields better results. It it, it makes it so that, um, again, it's not just about, oh, I plan to work out tomorrow. No, it's much deeper than that. Yeah. It's actually, I am going to do this activity for this amount of time, and then I'll know that by hitting a certain metric or measurement that yeah. I've done it. And then you know you know when you're done <laughs> as right. well and you have that feeling of accomplishment which is which is what productivity is all about. So I I think the key here for us is we need to know how to enter in well one we need to know how to exit out of autopilot mode and enter into hyper focus mode and scatter focus mode uh yeah. more intentionally. <laughs> so yeah well well this was one of the surprising things that i found was that there are actual concrete steps that we can follow in order to focus. And, and this is modeled after, you know, hyperfocus isn't just some some idea that that I came up with, you know, to write a book and and charge 
more on on the speaking circuit, <laughs> like like uh, like some folks do. Uh, you know, I, I looked at the research and I poured over hundreds of studies into how we manage our attention and really went in deep, deeper than I did with the Productivity Project on this idea. Uh, I talked to experts, dozens of experts, including oddly enough at Microsoft. They they have an entire research department full of thousands of of researchers, uh, dozens of whom study our attention and how distracted we are throughout the day, uh, oddly enough. You know, the company, I hope they don't listen to this, but but the company that is responsible largely for how distracted we are in the first place, those little Outlook notifications popping up into the corner of our screen and, and things like that, is conducting research into our attention. But essentially, when we focus on something, the research shows that we follow the same few steps each time. Uh, we focus on something, our attention gets distracted. And we, you know, another thing that I found is we tend to focus on external distractions, but internal distractions are just as essential. Um, this is why David Allen's system, getting things done, is so uh, powerful. You know, our head is for for having ideas, not for holding them. Um, and why it's it's so powerful to, uh, to build up the quality of our attention so our mind wanders against our will less often. Um, so we focus on something, our attention gets distracted, and then we bring it back. And so we go through this, this wheel of attention almost, um, and we can kind of model the steps by which we should focus throughout the day based on, on these, uh, these steps here. So maybe first we start with an intention because that's what should precede the, the attention we give to our work and our life. So step one, I think, is we choose uh, something productive or meaningful on which we can focus, um, because that's where attention has to start. Um, so number two, you eliminate as many external and internal distractions as you can, so that out of all the things you could potentially focus on, the intention that you set becomes the most attractive. Because in the moment, Facebook or email will always be more uh, sexy than the report that you really want to be writing or the Excel sheet that that you need to update with your quarterly budget uh, estimates. Um, and, and then three, after you tame distractions, after you have that intention, uh, you focus on that object of attention. And then four, continually draw your attention back to it. And so choose something to focus. They're very simple, right? But but there's there's a lot of complexity embedded within these these ideas. Um, choose something productive or meaningful to focus on. Eliminate external and internal distractions. Uh, focus. It's kind of the easier step. Uh, and because you you know focus is isn't something you do in the moment. It's something you do ahead of time to prepare yourself to be able to do it in the moment. And then you bring your attention back to that thing when it wanders. And so, the, yeah, it's, uh, it's simple, but it's complicated at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the thing is, is that there's a lot of places there where you can get tripped up, but if you're intentional about honing those four steps into as if they were skills, which I guess, I, I guess they are because they are, especially number four. Uh, I mean, you could do yeah. all the work in the world on steps one through three. You get to number four, where you still <laughs> where you draw will, it back. Yeah, you're you're just you're still going to. I mean, yeah, I can be sitting here in focus, and I can be working on something with no distractions. I've predetermined that. You know, I, I mean, I've I've sat down and I've eliminated internal ones. I've made sure that nothing external is going to step in and drag me away. But inevitability always is a key factor here where a new thought comes up. My brain isn't going <laughs> to stop working on other things just because I'm looking at one thing right now. And that's where, you know, I guess that's where meditation comes in is to practice yeah. that focusing of the mind. Of course, then the other thing is just to have that, uh, that list nearby where, Hey, if this thing that just popped up in my head, like instead of having the thought and letting, and then letting the thought pass, if I quick turn and write it down and then turn back to where I am, especially if it's handwritten, not technology typed, uh, I can easily come back to what's at the task at hand. 
Yeah, and and this is, I think, the key. And this is where hyperfocus helps, where we bring more of our attention. Instead of dividing our attention, we spend one minute on our phone, then two minutes on in Excel, then one minute on Twitter. We we give more of our time to one thing. And as a consequence of this, we give more attention to one thing because there's this this idea of attentional residue, which is the the fragments of the previous thing we were just doing that remain in our attentional space as we switch to doing something else. And so it's basically impossible, um, especially when we're, we don't have some kind of time pressure, it turns out. Um, it, it's essentially impossible to focus uh, completely on uh, our phone and then completely on a report and then completely on a conversation that we happen to be having and then completely on podcasts that we're listening to. Our, a part of our mind is always on the previous thing, especially when there wasn't time pressure to complete that previous thing. And this is the fascinating thing about our attention and why it's so uh, vital that we focus on just one thing for an extended period of time. This is where the length of time that we focus on something comes into play because the longer we focus on something, the less residue exists from the previous thing that we were doing and the greater the likelihood that we become totally immersed in that thing. And th th this speaks to a construct uh, called meta-awareness, which is essentially just uh, awareness of, uh, of what we're aware about, of what's occupying our attentional space in any one moment. And, you know, the more often we check up on what's occupying our attention. And the the more quickly we're able to get back on track when our mind does wander. And also being kind to our mind when we find it wandering is very helpful here too. One study, uh, another study conducted by Daniel Gilbert from, I believe, uh, Stanford, he found that when he sampled a bunch of people, what they were doing throughout the day, at any given moment, their mind was wandering 47% of the time. And so that's essentially where we're starting out at. You know, our, we're only bringing 53% of our attention to what we're doing in any given moment. And so the more often we check up on what's occupying our attention, um, the, uh, the more productive we, we can become because we can realign our focus to that object of attention that, that we cleared distractions for and that we set an intention for. Um, just to, <clears throat> just to give, uh, folks, something tactical that they could do right away, which is which is always why I personally listen to these shows, is um, if you set an hourly chime on your phone or an hourly timer, um, it, it's a super powerful thing to do. And when the timer goes off, it's kind of like a, an hourly awareness chime in a way. This trains this construct of meta-awareness, how aware you are over your own attention. And you, you can check up on, okay, was I distracted? And if I was, maybe I can tame that distraction for later. Uh, was I on intention or off intention? And if you're on intention, you can kind of keep going. Um, it, am I mind wandering or am I focused on what I'm doing? Or am I planning something in my mind related to what I'm doing, which is which is great too. Mind wandering uh, can be remarkably productive when it's conducive to our goals, which it is quite a bit of the time. And so this trains this idea, and so does meditation. Uh, you know, meditation actually expands the size of our attentional space, our working memory capacity, so we can contain more and process more in, in any given moment. It, it kind of builds up the the RAM, the random excess memory in our mind, uh, me meditation. Um, and so these these are ways, the hourly awareness chime, practicing this, this wonderful practice of meditation that we can help on that fourth step where we draw our attention back to what's truly important. As you were talking about the meditation and the, the upgrading the RAM, I was like, man, I'd love to upgrade the RAM in like my computer to a higher level, even though, you know, a year ago when I bought it, uh, it was the high, it was the most that you could get for this particular model. Uh, although now they've upgraded it to where you can, you can double it. And I'm like, wait, yeah. why would I not want to double my mental RAM? And yeah. I never thought about meditation being that and i think now i'm finally sold i mean i've i mean i know the benefits I've this is it this is what did it for yeah, you this is it like upgrading my mental ram is a necessity 
for myself personally. I don't even know like how much I actually even have. So that's kind of, you know, <laughs> anyway, like, uh, we, we got like 64 kilobits. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I've got a floppy it, it, disc of Ram inside of me. So. Yeah, really? <laughs> no, uh, honestly, uh, the amount of working memory that we have is incredibly constrained. What, one of my favorite parts about being on this show is a lot of so many productivity nerds, uh, listen to it so I can geek out about stuff like this. But the reason that scientists, posit that our, the RAM in our mind is limited, this working memory capacity. It even has the, the name memory in it. The, the working memory capacity is limited, is actually the same reason that the memory in our, our iPhone or our computer is, is limited. And so RAM in an iPhone, a- Apple resisted adding more RAM for this very reason for, for years, is because RAM is more power uh, heavy. And so it consumes a lot more power. If you double the RAM, if you go from 8 gigs to 16 gigs of RAM, it consumes significantly more memory. And if you don't have much going on in the moment on your computer, if you're just processing Word documents or even recording a podcast, you're not editing video, you might not need it. And so you can prioritize uh, battery life and, and other processes over the amount of RAM that you have. But the amount of memory that exists in our mind, especially in the moment, is is constrained for the same reason. You know, the, the scientists think that it's uh, it's uh, power. Uh, it, it was biologically and evolutionarily expensive uh, because the the working memory that we have consumes so much more energy. Our, our brain is already responsible for burning about twenty percent of the calories that we consume. I believe it's around a fifth of the calories we consume, and so we needed to save energy for for other mental processes for for survival for hunting for gathering and so you know our, our mind is limited for the same reason but these days you know we can only hold about uh, four chunks of information in our mind at one time. And so the amount of space we have for whatever the heck it is that we're doing in the moment is very very constrained. And because of this fact, we need all the help we can get in this area. And meditation helps us expand the the size of this attentional space, the size of our working memory capacity by as much as 30%. Um, So we're able to do 30% more in each moment. And in addition to this, we experience less attentional residue from the task that we just switched from. And so we don't only have more RAM to give to the world around us, which makes experiences more meaningful, which makes us more productive, but it makes us live a better life because we're able to do more in the moment. Uh, but, But we're able to actually transition quicker too and clean up the RAM that we do have, uh, which I think makes meditation so powerful, as well as this idea of of checking up on what's in our attention. So let's go the opposite direction of meditation and geek out on <laughs> caffeine and oh, coffee. Man. And so you talk about not just caffeine drinking. I mean, most people uh, who are listening to this, they're like, well, I mean, some people are tea drinkers, too, and I, and I am for sure. Uh, but you know, everybody's like, yeah, sure, coffee. I drink my coffee to make make sure I wake up. What about it? And you're talking about strategic caffeine drinking. So why the word strategic? I think most things are, are worth doing strategically. <laughs> uh, but the, ca- caffeine is, you know, as one of these people who, who uh, basically overthinks pretty much everything. But, but caffeine is one of these things that boosts our mental and our physical performance by almost every single measure. Um, It boosts our focus. It deepens our focus, regardless studies show on whether a task is simple or complex. But it also actually narrows our attention, as I talk about in the book a little bit, which makes it not good if we want to brainstorm something. So, you know, caffeine is kind of the opposite of alcohol in this way. Where alcohol, we all know that it's an, it, it, it increases our inhibition. And so, you know, we, we let ideas fly and we can brainstorm easier. Um, and so it's just like being tired in that way. But caffeine has the opposite effect where it narrows our focus. And so we might not be able to scatter our focus and enter scatter focus as creatively and as productively, but we can focus deeper on on one thing. Uh, it helps us persevere. It boosts our our performance on on all types of tasks. But we do experience that crash afterwards. And if you're drinking tea, what's your fa- what's what's your tea of choice? By the way, uh, I really like like a loose leaf green. 
for the most oh, part. Oh, yeah. man. You, you are a man after my own heart, <laughs> Aaron Fish. Well, I've got a coffee, <laughs> a coffee shop that I go to, and, and they do, do a great there, so... Oh, and they probably don't steep it. This is, I think, the biggest mistake people make with green tea is they brew it at 100 degrees Celsius. And so, you know, green tea is most flavorful at 80 degrees Celsius. And so if you if you boil it at 100, you essentially cook it. And everybody mm-hmm. thinks green tea is so bitter, but it has this very smooth taste that's kind of enveloping. But you only get that at around 80 uh, to 83, 84, 85 degrees Celsius. So, you know, one, one way to do this is to, uh, <laughs> this is off topic, but I find tea <laughs> fascinating. We have like 50 kinds of tea here at home, my fiance and I. Um, it, one way to do this is to put 100 degree water into a cup. And each time you transfer it to a different cup, it lowers the temperature by about 10 degrees. And so you you pour it into a cup, it's 100. You pour it into another cup, you're at 90. You pour it into a third cup, and you're at 80. And then you can steep the tea in there. Um, you know, wait 10, 15 seconds in each cup, and and then you're you're good again. Uh, but yeah, caffeine boosts our mental and our physical performance, especially by almost every single measure. But we have that crash afterwards. It, it's a bit dampened. Uh, with things like green tea and, and matcha, which each contain L-theanine, which dampens that crash. Um, but we need to use that that boost strategically, you know, provided it's not too late in the day. We can uh, have a bit before we work on something that that needs this deep level of focus. This is m- one of my favorite rituals. I did it this morning where I have a cup of tea. Um, you know, I like Starbucks because you get the unlimited tea refills. As much as a tea snob <laughs> that I am, I won't say no to unlimited refills. Um, you know, I have my noise-canceling headphones. I got my laptop. I got all, all my stuff. I'll turn on a distractions blocker on my computer. I'll leave my phone at home, and then I'll hyper-focus on, on writing in, in the morning. And we're, we're recording this relatively early in the morning, but I, I wrote about, I think, 2,000 words before, uh, before coming on the show because it's just entering that mode. It's setting that intention. It's getting the distractions out of the way. Then it's focusing while boosting it through things like caffeine and you know um, taming those distractions. Music is fascinating when it comes to our productivity too. Um, you know, Listening to something that's productive uh, helps as well. Yeah, one of my favorites uh, is Focus at Will. I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Have you tried those yeah. before? Yeah, uh, I'm I'm a lifelong uh, or I'm a lifetime um, or member, I guess you'd say. I, I I bought the lifetime pass or whatever you want to call it, the the plan, uh, because I just used it so much and just the ability for it to it, it not only keeps me from external distractions, it helps especially with the internal distractions yeah. it, it helps me to it kills that fight or flight mechanism yeah. as, as they talk about in their promotion stuff and by the way if anybody wants to check it out there's a free trial it's uh beyond hey. beyond the to-do list.com slash focus at will so check that low out. key plug i like yeah. it i like so, how you slid that in in there well, one of the people that I, oh sorry go ahead no go ahead no, I was going to say one of the people I interviewed in writing the book, because, you know, you get weird ideas from interesting places, I find, um, was a guy that he sold more music than Prince, than uh, Britney Spears, than Justin Bieber, than Bob Dylan. Um, he single handedly crafted the soundtrack to countless childhoods. Um, but You probably don't know his name. His name is Jerry Martin, and he composed the music for uh, video games such as uh, The Sims and SimCity, which have sold uh, well over, I think, 50 or, or 100 million copies worldwide. And so the music is in people's minds. And and I asked him, you know, he creates essentially music that will maximize the amount of time that we spend focusing on the game. And I asked him, so what? makes your music so conducive to focus. But but he said that it essentially comes down to a, a couple of two uh, ingredients. Uh, the first, that it is familiar. And so it's kind of familiar to what we've consumed in the past. It's not too eccentric. And so he uses inspiration from famous composers like Gershwin and, and folks like that. But also that it's simple. And so you probably, uh, the, uh, I've listened and I've used Focus at Will. I love it. Uh, and this is the reason why it's, it's familiar. And the music is very simple. It's linear. It changes without you knowing that it's changing. And it kind of supports the work that you're doing. 
Um, and this is why a lot of writers listen to the same song on repeat one, because even though it's a bit more complex, with the second listen, it becomes simple because your brain is be able to predict what's coming up. It doesn't perceive it as as a threat in your ears, and so you're able to hunker down and on focusing on what's important. And so simple and familiar it contains few elements, but it contain the elements that it does contain are familiar with what you're what you're already uh, enjoying. And you know, it, music is relative too. You know, if you're uh, in a quiet office, sometimes music won't help your productivity because it's relative. And if it's more complex than the environment that you're in, um, so dead silence usually isn't good because our mind perceives that as a threat. But it, it's fascinating that it's relative in that way. Uh, sometimes a coffee shop that I like going to here in the the small town in Canada I live in, they like playing talk radio over the speakers when there are very few people there. So pretty much any kind of music would be better than that. Oh, uh, but gosh, yeah, music is yeah. relative in that way. It's terrible. It's a I terrible had, situation. I, at that I, 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 I can live with, I, I can tell you, I lived through and you can tell where, how I said that, that, that it was living through because it was torture. <laughs> uh, about a month ago, we were in Florida at the airport trying to get back home and uh, we, we had a slight delay. So we're sitting there, you know, the kids are like, hey, can I get a donut? Da, 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 da. We're sitting there at some tables and there's no TV around, but the sound from a TV is coming through a speaker and it's <sighs> and it's it's a specific news program and it drove me nuts because I couldn't tune it out because it was talking. And it was just loud yeah. enough that uh, it, it just drove me nuts. So <sighs> I, I eventually yeah. said, "Hey, let's uh, let's uh, move, or actually, let's go to the uh, the gate. So <laughs> that'll be less distracting." So the, anyway. the, one of the most distracting things is uh, when you hear somebody on a phone conversation. <laughs> you know, you hear half of the the conversation, but but your mind uh, fills in. The other side of it's called a half a log, uh, like a monologue, but it's half of half of what you want to be hearing, and so it occupies more of your attention than a regular conversation. <laughs> that that's one of the worst things too. So we've spent a lot of time focusing on the hyper focus side of things. Let's go over to Here. the benefits oh, of scatter focus because this is one of those things where being unfocused yet it's focus is kind of a paradox, but incredibly productive <laughs> and and actually especially helpful when it comes to being creative. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason why, you know, we were chatting a bit about how our mind wanders, it mainly wanders between three places. It, it goes to the future, the present and the past, mostly the future with some of the past where we're strategically planning what we're working on. And you know, when we're focused, this is the odd part about our attention that I found, is we think we have so much control over our attention when we're focused, but really, we don't. Uh, because what we're doing and what we're, uh, quote unquote, perceptu perceptually coupled with in the moment is guiding our attention to the natural next step. And, you know, like we were chatting with, with the bat, uh, off the bat, is this is kind of where autopilot mode can help us because we have the the intention that we set to accomplish something. And then within the constructs of that attention, we, we follow through uh, with it. But when our mind is wandering and we're aware, you know, we think our attention is going to someplace beyond our control, but really, uh, we're, we're, we have no less control over our attention when we're, when we're letting it wander, when we kind of like, when we say roam free, roam wherever you want. Uh, and there, there are a few ways that we can do this that I found, you know, we can, um, kind of sit somewhere with a notepad. Sometimes I like to do this. This is a good strategy coupled with getting things done. I find where you sit somewhere with a notepad and just capture what comes to the surface of, of your attentional space, the to do's, the things you're waiting on, the people you haven't contacted uh, in a while, uh, all these different things. Um, there's kind of a problem crunching mode that some of us do where we scatter our attention, where you know, we're deciding, do we want to accept the job or do we want to uh, do we want to get married this year or next year? And we kind of chew it over when we're going on a walk. Um, but the most powerful way that I those, those are great for capturing and, and solving problems, but the most powerful way that we can scatter our attention is to do something uh, simple 
and habitual. And most of us only get this when we're uh, taking a shower, but when we uh, deliberately let our mind wander, this is one of the the most powerful ways that we can do so. Uh, Whether we're taking a shower, whether we're uh, swimming laps, whether we're just sipping on our morning coffee with a notepad and and (laughs) capturing whatever might come up. Um, This mode, when we do something habitual, this is kind of an anchor for our attention. We're not laying on the couch bored. We're not um, we're not doing something along those lines. We're doing something simple that anchors our attention. And this has been shown to lead to more creative insights. And it makes uh, entering scatter focus fun. We're able to rest at the same time. And we scatter our attention for longer, uh, all hopefully while checking in where our attention has wandered off to. Because when we couple this scattering of our, of our attention with this meta awareness of where our mind wanders off to, which you know the hourly awareness chime helps with, and tactics like that help with, um, and meditation, um, we uh, were able to capture the ideas that are floating around in our mind. And this speaks to the power of our, of our brain's default mode network. This is the the brain network that our mind you know, it's in the name, it defaults to when we don't focus on anything in particular. And it's this network is scattered across our entire brain. It, it, it includes our memory, it includes our prefrontal cortex, it can, it can, and our memories are scattered across our brain too. And so this is why we come up with so many great ideas in this mode, because we wander to the past and we remember the book that we were listening to yesterday. We, re, we remember a conversation we were having, and we connect that with a problem that we're going to face later later on in the week that we're focusing on in the present, then we connect the two to come up with one of those beautiful uh, light bulb insight moments where a solution strikes us from out of the blue. Um, This is the benefit of this habitual mode. And and I I think you can kind of zero in on three main benefits as it relates to scattering your attention. Um, You know, we all need to rest our attention because we only have a limited capacity capacity to focus, which, you know, uh, that capacity depends on how difficult our work is, how uh, and how often we need to regulate our behavior away from distraction and to focus on something that we don't care about, for example. Uh, But the, the main benefits are we get to rest, we get to ideate, and we get to plan. And so this is, I think, the strategic mode of our brain, in addition to the creative mode of our brain, which lets us come up with these beautiful ideas, and it's also the resting part of our brain. Uh, This is why, you know, I mentioned it a little bit. I love to knit. It's habitual. It doesn't occupy my full attention. It's restful. It, uh, it, It lets me plan, and it lets me come up with ideas. You wouldn't think you'd get many ideas when we when you're doing something so simple, but what looks simple on the surface is... uh, remarkably complex uh, inside of your mind. It, it's it's just amazing to me how, in, in a weird way, our brain just almost never stops working, really. So if we shift into that yeah. lower, if we shift into that lower gear, that it's a different kind of focus, but an equally important kind of focus. And it, yeah, it's a it's a more deliberate focus almost. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think. What might not be obvious to some people is if we tie some of the things together that we've talked about in this conversation, number one, maybe have some coffee first thing or near first thing in the morning and sit down and do hyper focusing first, because then later on, the effects of the caffeine will not be as present. And you could carve out some space maybe in the afternoon to unfocus or I should say scatter focus. So, you know, hard focused work early. Uh, you know, front loaded and, and focused and, and knock things out to completion, whatever that specific metric means. And then afternoon or later in the day, having scatter focus time to where you're ideating and resting, et cetera, and then repeat. Exactly. Not, not the yeah. Day, and uh, the next day and so on. Yeah. <laughs> Don't just get, you got to sleep. You got to sleep somewhere in there. But yes. yeah, I, I think that's a, it, it's such a great strategy that that's the power of, of deliberately managing your attention. Uh, you know, it's, you know, hyperfocus is a catchy title for a book, but it, that, that's only a part of it, right? We need to focus, but we need to let our mind wander and we need to use these modes and deploy them strategically, like, like you were saying. So I, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, working around your energy levels too. So if you find that you naturally have a lot 
less energy in the morning, maybe that's the time. Maybe when you get to work, wait a couple hours to, to have a coffee yes. and brainstorm and, and plan your week. on a, Maybe only do this on Monday because your work might become hell if you don't consume any caffeine for the first few hours of the day. Um, you know, everybody's different. But you know, maybe do this on Monday so you can plan your week and think, okay, what opportunities will I have to rest and scatter my attention this week? How much productivity and creativity do I need this week? Can I schedule blocks of time this week to hyper-focus, to, to set intentions and then eliminate distractions, then then bring my mind back when it wanders? And uh, yeah, the, the just one thing I'd add to that is, curiously, we have the greatest capacity to focus when we have the most energy. But we have uh, the, the greatest capacity for creativity when we have the least amount of energy. Uh, because this is when our prefrontal cortex, the logical part of our brain, is the, le the least inhibited. And so it lets ideas fly. We, we, we don't kind of block ideas out of our attention because we don't we have less inhibition. Uh, and so uh, th that's something that I'd encourage people to do. Notice when you're naturally tired during the day and do something to scatter your attention. But make sure you have a notepad nearby because you'll probably want to capture what comes up. The point there is then you've you've generated new ideas to then sift through and next time you hyper focus, drill deep and do something with them. Exactly. So, uh well the book is again called Hyper Focus, How to Be More Productive in a World of Distraction, but it's also how to scatter focus. So uh it's it's really all about the different sides of the coin of focus and it's coming out soon. Uh it's gonna probably be ready for pre order. Uh actually it's probably already out there right now for pre order. By the time this drops, it's already maybe out. If you maybe check. it's in the world. Yes, maybe it's, maybe in, it's the out in the world. I, I am <laughs> holding a tangible copy right now, but you can too. So uh, we didn't even – there's a couple of things in my notes that are like hugely geek out stuff that we don't have time to go into. <laughs> so that's a good sign. Oh, man, we got to do it again. Book. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> tell people where they can find you, Chris, and find out more yeah. about grabbing the book. And I'll link it up in the show notes and everything too. Cool. Yeah, the website for the book is hyperfocusbook.com. And uh, the website that I have, which no longer includes a newsletter pop-up, at least, you know, depending on when this episode comes out and how the experiment goes, uh, is my website is called a life of productivity.com. Awesome. Chris, it's always oh, and nice it's in to bookstores talk everywhere that I forgot. I, you know, support your local booksellers. I, I always yeah. um, like, you know, I know a few local booksellers are all really good people um, and uh, and uh, you should support them, too. Yeah, go there and, and uh, order it. Go pre-order yeah. it through them, and then they'll they'll yeah. tell you when it's in, and and that's a great way to go. To be honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. They call you, you you go in, you pick up the book. It's nice. You get to talk to a person instead of a UPS delivery driver, <laughs> which they don't always talk. So anyway. no, no. Uh, gosh, uh, Chris, always awesome to talk <laughs> with you, and let's do it again soon. We should, man. Thanks so much for having me. So. Number one, I'm definitely going to have Chris come back on the show again sooner than the difference between last time and this time. Just way too much stuff that we could have dug into in this conversation that we didn't get to, which means there's a ton left for you to grab in the book, which you can find the link to at beyondthetodolist.com slash 238. It is out as of right now. And thank you for listening. If you know somebody who needs to tap into hyper focus and scatter focus, think of that one person. Share this episode with them, and I will see you next episode. <laughs>